Now, uh, we'll do instrumentation, then we'll get right to our fascinating case study at the end. So, how can we come in and intervene uh, with the current state of clinical care? The devices I've shown you so far are mostly for research. What's the current active clinical use for peripheral nervous system? Well, electromyography, EMG, very widely used. Um, it's used for diagnosis primarily. Um, very simple surface recording electrodes that are made by Medtronic. Sometimes you can have penetrating electrodes if you need very precise uh, uh, recording from a particular muscle. Um, but you can, for example, there's a nerve, the median nerve, which runs down the arm. This is what's uh, frequently damaged in carpal tunnel syndrome. There's a little tunnel of, uh, that runs through fibrous tissue in the wrist called the carpal tunnel, and the median nerve can be disrupted in that. And you can assess disruptions in median nerve function. Uh, you can record with surface electrodes over the uh, thenar muscles, the muscles in the, uh, that control the thumb, and you can stimulate at various upstream. Uh, and you can measure the latency and the amplitude of the muscle response. And that's incredibly helpful. Let's go back to Guillaume Barre. What do you see if you do that? Well, uh, what you can do is measure things like the distal latency. The latency to recording that uh, electrical response in the uh, muscle of the thumb. And you can also measure the amplitude of the compound muscle action potential, CMAP. And this is what it normally looks like. And also after recovery, you get, uh, there's a short latency, 4.9 milliseconds to the onset of this muscle action potential. Uh, and in acute Guillain-Barre, you actually get a much greater distal latency, and the amplitude of the resulting action potential is spread out and uh, reduced amplitude. So this is characteristic of the demyelination that happens in Guillain-Barre. You've got reduced myelin, you've got slower conduction. It's highly variable. It's not that the muscle itself is damaged. So one question is, well, you know, why is the muscle action potential lower? Well, the answer is it's involved, it's kind of like a pull of all the muscles, first of all. Some of them are not getting their spikes at all because the spike has, has failed and died out, but also because there's highly variable conduction now among all the different axons that subserve the muscle. You've spread out the action potential. The spikes are arriving at different times, and the net amplitude at, any, at the peak uh, is reduced for that reason. So this is a characteristic pattern for a peripheral nervous system demyelinating disorder. Uh, increased distal latency, reduced compound muscle. Now, um, that's what, you know, we can see for pure demyelination, Guillain-Barre, decreased conduction velocity, decreased compound muscle action potential, increased distal latency. See something totally different with upper motor neurons, like a stroke. Everything's completely normal, okay? So this can really help. Someone comes in with uh, uh, weakness, you do the EMG studies, and it's completely normal, that turns your attention to the central nervous system. What's going on uh, centrally that could be wrong? And then you can get, uh, with neuromuscular junction disorders, you get a, a different pattern. You get normal conduction for velocity and distal latency, right? Because the nerves themselves are fine. So the speed at which the action potential gets down the axon is unchanged. But then things right at the muscle are altered. You've got impaired release uh, of neurotransmitter or impaired acetylcholine action, and you have reduced uh, uh, muscle action potential. Very helpful diagnostically. You can also come in and stimulate with some of these uh, transcutaneous electrodes. These are called TENS units. Um, it's not completely clear how useful they are. They can help people who have some peripheral pain syndromes. You just hold it over the uh, painful area. People who have diabetic neuropathy, for example, this can help, or lower back pain. Uh, <coughs> some of the parameters of the pulses are shown here. Uh, it's they, not completely clear how this works. It might stimulate release of endorphins. It might effectively just distract the patient from the pain. Um, and so that's an interesting avenue for control. There is another avenue for control, which is not yet in clinical practice, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's what our, our group is known for working on, and this is something we call optogenetics. So electrodes, if you put them into neural tissue, you can't discriminate different kinds of cells. You can stimulate everything that's nearby, but you have no cell type resolution. 
With optogenetics, what we do is we confer light sensitivity onto neurons, which are normally not light sensitive at all. And we do that by bringing uh, light activated ion channels and pumps that we get from microbial organisms like algae that make light activated regulators of ion flow. And we put those under genetic control uh, and we introduce those into the targeted neurons. And then we can bathe the whole tissue or the whole nerve in light, but only the cells that we've made light sensitive will respond. And you can turn on or turn off using optogenetic exciters or inhibitors. So that affords the possibility for selective control. It's kind of cool what these uh, proteins are, are look like. These are called opsins, and they're seven transmembrane proteins, just like G-protein coupled receptors, except uh, they form a dimer. And if you turn it on its end and you look, there's actually a pore uh, through which ions can flow, and they flow in a, a light regulated way. And we've found a huge diversity of these different opsins. They respond to all different colors of light, as shown here. And they've got all kinds of kinetic properties operating from the millisecond scale to 30 minutes or so. And so you can pick the one you want based on the kinetics of the sort of response you want. But the neat thing about these is it's just a single gene that controls both light sensation and ion flow. So it's very easy to deliver just one gene. You don't need to add chemicals. They're from biology, so they use well-tolerated wavelengths and intensities of light, uh, and they're very fast. And here, capitalizing on millions of years of evolution, nature has built these to be low noise, low dark activity, and fast responses, um, and big spectral diversity. And, and so this is kind of interesting, but first question is, how do you get light in? Well, you can use fiber optics to get light in, and so uh, this is, the scattering problem, light is heavily scattered in neural tissue, and this is due to the refractive index changes between lipid and water. And this is, if you just focus down here, this is the drop off of light power density as a function of depth in tissue. And you're down to 1%, this is a log scale, you're down to 1% of your initial irradiance values by the time you're just one millimeter deep in tissue. So you can't just apply surface light, uh, but you can put in a fiber optic. And so we built fiber optic probes. That these are even thinner than the deep brain stimulation electrodes that are used in patients. They can be 200 nanometers. Control neural circuits with uh, very high precision. You can stick electrodes on them as well. So this is fiber optic in cross section, 200 microns in diameter. But we've put on uh, electrodes as well, so we can both record and generate a closed loop uh, stimulation device. Pretty light. They weigh less than two grams, and freely running mouse can carry them. So, and the last thing before we get uh, toward the case study, this is a very recent uh, set of work that uh, um, was initiated by uh, Scott Delp and his colleagues, and we helped out on the study. But they did a peripheral nervous system intervention. They made peripheral axons in the sciatic nerve light sensitive with a channel rhodopsin, one of these blue light activated <coughs> excitatory channels, and they coupled it to a yellow fluorescent protein, so you can see these axons in cross-section that are going to be light sensitive inside the overall nerve. And they did some interesting studies. So they took a animal and they put a optical cuff, basically LED cuff, around the peripheral nerve. And now you can start to see how you might selectively recruit a subset of fibers within the axon if you can guide the expression of the channel rhodopsin to a subset of those cells. If you just take control mice, you can give an electrical stimulation, you see a nice EMG response, nice force generation by the muscle. Uh, blue light alone in control animals doesn't do anything. But then if you have these animals that have the channel rhodopsin in the peripheral nerves, you can see nice EMG responses to light and force generation response to light. And amazingly, the light response, because it doesn't rely on this uh, uh, generation of node-to-node -node, uh, current flow, but directly induces a spike uh, in the uh, target axon, it recruits the small fibers first, which is what we call orderly recruitment, and a completely the opposite order of recruitment that electrical stimulation generates. And so that is pretty interesting. That allows you to achieve fine control. Also, it greatly reduces fatigue. And so because you tend to recruit these large, fast fatiguing fibers first with electrical stimulation, you get very rapid drop off in the muscle tension that's generated uh, over time. But the optical approach is much more uh, stable, much more fatigue resistant. 
And recently another group, not involving either uh, Scott's group or myself, but Scott wrote a perspective on it in science. It just came out last week. But pretty interesting bioengineering application combining optogenetics with stem cells for a, 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 a peripheral nerve uh, intervention in, in mice. And they did a pretty cool thing. They made uh, stem cells express channel rhodopsin and then they differentiated them into uh, uh, peripheral motor neurons. And so this is pretty cool. You can make human ES cells express uh, channel rhodopsins, and we showed that back in 2010, and you can get currents from the stem cells. And you can turn them into neurons and get action potentials, and, and that, uh, that was also shown back in 2010. What this group did just last week is they said, well, let's put in uh, these embryoid body graphs of neurons, uh, of, of cells that have been differentiated toward the neural lineage. We're going to implant them directly into the uh, the uh, nerve, and they're going to regrow as peripheral axons will do, okay? So they're going to send out their nerves and innervate the target muscle. Now they won't have, since we're injecting right into the nerve, they won't have synapses. They're not going to be controlled by the brain anymore. So that's okay. We're going to control them uh, with light. So we're going to come in and put a cuff around there, and now we've got, uh, and they indeed showed that, this characteristic fatigue resistant pattern compared to the fatiguing electrical stimulation. So it's a combination stem cell optogenetic uh, control tool for peripheral nervous.